All right, so let's get a response now. Let's bring in Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. Good to talk to you. I uh, hope that you're about to have a, a very relaxing Labor Day weekend. Ha, ha, ha. Um, <laughs> wanted to ask you about this feud that you've got going on with Nikki Haley. She dinged you uh, at the debate, as did many of uh, your other GOP colleagues. But then you fired back at her using her first name and her maiden last name. You even spelled her first name wrong. Now, I expect it wasn't you that actually penned that tweet. But why do that? Well, look, I think uh, it was a playful jest at the fact that she's been mispronouncing my name for the longest time. It's Vivek. It rhymes with cake. I'd expect someone of Nikki's background to be able to get that right. So I believe in a little bit of banter on the basketball court. We're having fun in this race. But I do think that there is a real distinction. And I think that I am the only candidate who was on that stage who was a non-neocon. I believe in standing for American interests, asserting American interests, but only where it advances the U.S. interest. That's very different from other candidates that would sooner send troops to defend an invasion across somebody else's border than to use troops to defend across the invasion on our own southern border in this country. I worry that many in the neocon establishment are quietly, even if accidentally, marching us into World War III, serious armed conflict with other nuclear powers, including the combination of the Russia-China alliance. I am the only candidate in this race who has pointed out the Russia-China alliance and the threat that it poses, and a clear plan to pull them apart from each other. So yes, everybody agrees that men shouldn't be swimming in, the, in women's swimming competitions. I'm glad we all agree on that. But I think when it comes to foreign policy, that's really what distinguishes okay. me from the Karl Rove, Nikki Haley, Mike Pence, Chris Christie wing. And I think that debate is going to be good well, for Well, interesting party. you didn't mention uh, Donald Trump in there. We'll ask you about that in just a second. But here was Nikki Haley. She was on this program just a couple of days ago, and she responded to your campaign misspelling her birth name, uh, where you also called her a liar. Listen. I'm not going to get involved in these childish name games. It's pretty pathetic. I, first of all, I was born with Nikki on my birth certificate. I was raised as Nikki. I'm married to Haley. And so that is what my name is. So he can say or misspell or do whatever he wants, but he can't step away from the fact that, look, He's the one that said he was going to abandon Israel. Those were his words. Now he's wanting to walk it back. And the reality is you have to understand the importance of our allies and those relationships. We can never be so narcissistic to think that we don't need friends. I think you can tell a lot about the kind of leader someone will be based on how they run their campaign. And, and he's doing that all on his own. So is that true to say that you are walking back some of those claims? And, and by the way, are you walking back? Not at all. OK, explain. Not at all. I've, st I've stood firmly for advancing American interests. I've been very clear that our relationship with Israel by the end of my first term will be stronger than it has ever been because I will treat it as a true friendship, not a transactional relationship. I don't talk in the way that standard GOP talking points advise you to speak, but I'm speaking with an authenticity on that relationship. Take the Abraham Accords to the next level. Add Saudi Arabia, Oman, Qatar, Indonesia to that pact. I've been crystal clear that it is a vital U.S. interest to make sure that Iran never comes anywhere close to a nuclear weapon. We have to work with Israel to make sure that happens. And yes, I have said that we would back Israel fully, militarily. But I've also said that I don't want our sons and daughters, U.S. troops, to die in that conflict. And if they're going to distort that to say that I'm not going to stand for Israel, then I'm happy to have the debate where Nikki Haley or Mike Pence or Chris Christie can state how many U.S. soldiers they'd like to see die in that conflict. Oh, wait, I've asked that question. I haven't gotten a response. But for my part, I have been clear. Yes, we stand with Israel. And you know what? For my part, I want to learn from our friends in Israel. I would love their border policies in this country. I would love their tough on crime policies and their strong national identity and a missile defense system like they have in this country. And so I admire and respect our friends. I'll have Bibi over to the White House in a way that Joe Biden couldn't. But yes, it's true that I'm not talking about this in the way that standard Republican partisans are taught to by the talking points they get from their super PACs. That's what makes me different. But it is also what will make our relationships with our foreign partners and friends that much more authentic. So, so let me ask you about two other foreign policy issues. One is Taiwan, and then the other one is Ukraine and, and Russia and sure. ending that conflict. You've said that you'd fully back Taiwan until the U.S. becomes independent with semiconductors. Yes. So what happens after that point? Do we just give ta Taiwan to China? So, John, that's how my position, again, has been caricatured. Let's get real here. 
but the U.S. But position said, right now you, is one of embracing. Back, well, I want to get I'm real. Sorry, Vivek. Let me just say, you've said that, that you would back. I, I did not Taiwan say we would hand them over until, to Ta China. No, I know yeah. you didn't say that. That's that was my question. What you have yeah. said is we will fully back Taiwan until we become independent in semiconductor production. And my question is, what happens after that? After which point? After which point we resume the status quo, which is which strategic is? ambiguity, which is what I was beginning to explain to you, John. Right now, the status quo is the U.S. embraces the one China policy. Both Republicans and Democrats, every other Republican in this race embraces the one China policy. Strategic ambiguity, refusing to call Taiwan a nation. Recall that President Trump was derided by both parties for picking up a phone call from the Taiwanese president. That's our current status quo with respect to China. I think that's insufficient. I think we have to be crystal clear that we will defend Taiwan. So I'm upgrading to strategic clarity, saying that absolutely we will defend Taiwan until we get semiconductor independence, because that's why Taiwan matters most to the U.S. They provide the chips that power our modern way of life. And after that, we resume the current so don't we status also support quo, a robust which is strategic ambiguity. China's shores? So, look, I think that I think we should support them more than we are now. That robust democracy, it, John, I'll remind you. Oh, absolutely. But the fact of the matter is the current U.S. establishment in both parties, including the Republican Party, does not even recognize Taiwan as a nation right now. One China is our policy. So, John, that's actually a caricature. It's laughable to say that when I'm saying Taiwan is a nation, that we actually will defend it until and unless we have semiconductor independence and then we resume the status quo. That's honest. That's clear. And that is actually a more strong Taiwan posture than either party has offered. And again, this takes an outsider to call out the bluff. The fact that Trump couldn't pick up a phone call from the Taiwanese president before being derided. Those are the same people that are saying that because I'll say I'll defend Taiwan, okay. but I'm clear until it has semiconductor right, so independence very clearly, contorted. So I think you have to understand the status quo. This is clearly a, a, another instance where we've seen you embrace the former president. He's obviously also stepping up and showing some support for you. Um, a young, interesting candidate he's re uh, referring to you as. Uh, if you were to continue to climb in the polls, he could be a competitor for you on the GOP primary stage. How do you differentiate yourself? We, we know your similarities. Where do you differentiate yourself with yeah. the former president, Donald Trump? I'm 38 years old. I have fresh legs. We are reaching the next generation of young Americans. That is why I can win this election in a landslide in a way that no other candidate can. Look at the way we're running this campaign. I've gone to the inner city of Chicago, Kensington in the middle of Philadelphia, places where traditional Republican candidates dare not touch. We're leaving no state left behind, no city left behind, no American left behind, already building a multi-ethnic working class coalition. And I think this cannot be a 50.1 election. I think this has to be a landslide moral mandate like Ronald Reagan delivered in 1980. That's what I'm aiming to do so in 2024. That, so, so do you, That's based the on single the question, most important thing to reunite you're this country. you're directly aligned with his policies? I didn't hear a difference other than age. You no, know, we have our... We have some of our areas of differences, but they are small. By and large, we're the two America first candidates in this race. Everybody embraces, everybody else embraces the neocon foreign policy view. So I think we're deeply aligned on policy 90 plus percent of the way. There are some small differences. I would rescind affirmative action. I would militarize the southern border instead of just building the wall. I would shut down the U.S. Department of Education, not just put a good person, Betsy DeVos, on top to reform it. Those are details. But the main difference is I will be able to unite this country by leading the next generation of Americans to a vision of what it means to be an American. Revive national pride in that next generation where it is lacking. I think we have an opportunity to reunite this country around our shared ideals. And that will allow me to take the America first agenda even further than Donald Trump did by building on what I think is a very good foundation that he laid. And so the fact that I'm not running against him that doesn't mean anything. I'm running for this country, and that's the way I'm going to lead us to national unity. That's my job, and I expect to do it as the next president. All right. Vivek Ramaswamy, still lots to talk about, and we will in the days and weeks ahead. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you up very much. Good Labor Day weekend. Thank you. All right. All right.